Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak on the evolution of glaucoma tube surgery. I have some financial disclosures, but specifically advanced ophthalmic innovations, the manufacturer of the Paul glaucoma implant, in which I do have financial interest. Tube surgery in the modern era really started with the Maltino implant, which in created a permanent sclerostomy, which is unable to close. But it was more than that. Uh, Tony Maltino realized that equatorial drainage was important, that equatorial fibroblasts are less active than around the limbus. And the plate was essential to prevent external obstruction and also to predetermine the bleb surface area. And these three components remain with us in modern aqueous shunt implants today. But the early implants had a high risk of complications from hypotony and long-term IOP control was not very good. The flow control was improved dramatically by the Ahmed glaucoma valve and also by the subconjunctival MIGS devices that we have today. But encapsulation is still the main long-term determinant of IOP control and only really seriously tackled by the Barvelt implant. Corneal endothelial cell loss remains a serious problem. There's probably influenced to a large degree by surgical technique, but also to some degree by device manufacture design. Exposure and erosion happen in a small percentage, but even when good patching and with great technique. And diplopia is unpredictable, even when avoiding the supranasal quadrant and similar rates overall with both the Ahmed and Barvelt implants. In order to investigate the risk factors for endothelial cell loss in eyes implanted with Barvelt glaucoma implants, we carried out a five-year prospective study published at last year in Ophthalmology Glaucoma after being presented at the American Glaucoma Society in Washington. The results were interesting in that we found a 37% reduction in central endothelial cell density at five years and a 50% reduction in endothelial cell density over the area of the tube. This is perhaps not unexpected, although only one eye actually developed corneal decompensation in the five years of the study. However, the study quite clearly showed that tube insertion position was a highly significant factor in uh, determining endothelial cell loss. If the tube entry site was straddling Schwalbe's line, eyes lost almost 50% of central endothelial cell density. Whereas if all of the tube was behind Schwalbe's line, this was less than 25%. Still significant, but half the rate of loss that was experienced when the tube was straddling Schwalbe's line. So what about putting the tube in the sulcus rather than the anterior chamber? Well, this is trickier and does cause more bleeding and requires a peripheral iridectomy or pushing the tube through the iris into the anterior chamber. And there are no prospective trials comparing anterior chamber with sulcus. But this study published in ophthalmology last year did show that sulcus tubes result in less endothelial cell loss than anterior chamber tubes. However, I must point out that in this study, the sulcus tube endothelial cell loss rate was still slightly greater than we experienced when the tube was behind Schwalbe's line. So placing the tube behind Schwalbe's line may be just as good as putting it in the sulcus. And in summary, the tube tip position may be important. It should never be close to the cornea, but the tube entry site position seems to be critically important in avoiding endothelial cell loss. But it's not all doom and gloom. This is a left bar valve implanted in 2007 and the video is 12 years later and you can see the cornea is clear and the pressure is controlled. This is the right eye implanted in 2002 and the video is 17 years later. And again, the cornea is clear and the pressure is well controlled. What about new innovation? Well, the bar valve implant, as I've mentioned, is the most effective IOP lowering implant available. And, but the plate is very large. The huge bar vault contrasts dramatically with the MIGS trend to much smaller tubes, such as the Zen and the pressure flow. The bar vault plate is large for good reason, as this is responsible for the long-term high efficacy level. 
But at 640 microns in diameter, like the almond valve, the tube is larger than required. The 640 micron barbell almond occupy the entire angle. And they're in contact with the cornea at their entry site, even when they're lying flat on the iris, as you can see here. As we've already heard, tube contact with corneal endothelium at the entry site kills endothelial cells. And a large tube in the scleral surface always carries a small risk of erosion. The erosion risk is reduced but not eliminated by a donor tissue patch or a long scleral tunnel. Minimally invasive tubes such as the Zen are much smaller. And the pressure flow. Mixed tubes are not for complex cases, but do show that small tubes can produce a large IOP drop. And on gonioscopy, the size difference between the barvelt and, for example, the Zen is quite dramatic. And you can see here that the Zen is very small compared with the barvelt. The barvelt is actually larger than the two Zens put together. Even the slightly larger pressure flow can fit inside the bar vault, although it's a very tight squeeze. Small tubes don't completely eliminate the risk of erosion, although erosion is much less common and patch grafts are not used with these tubes. With the smaller subconjunctival MIGS tubes, Erosion seems to occur in less than 1% of cases. And the Zen, if it's eroded here, is easily removed, although this is obviously not a permanent solution. These smaller tubes, however, likely carry a much lower risk of endothelial cell damage simply because of their size. The pole glaucoma implant at 342 mm squared has a similar surface area to the bar vault. The breadth is less than that of the bar vault, but the depth is one millimeter greater. In theory, this change in plate design should result in more usable plate surface area that is not covered by rectus muscles. But critically, the tube portion of the pole glaucoma implant is much smaller than the bar valve and only slightly larger than a pressure flow. And you can see the two end to end. And in profile, you can see how much larger the bar valve is than both the pole and the pressure flow. With the tube lumen of the pole glaucoma implant at 127 microns, it's much smaller than an amid or a bar vault. And therefore can be occluded with a 6O proline suture to reduce flow rather than the larger 3O that's required for a bar vault. The tube is typically stented all the way into the anterior chamber, and in this, most cases this provides enough resistance to prevent early hypotony. The proline stent is seen here in the anterior chamber in gonioscopy. The implant is placed under adjacent recti like a bar vault, though the PGI does not extend as far under the muscles. The PGI plate, like a bar valve, is best placed roughly 10 millimetres or more from the limbus. The plate is tightly secured to sclera using nanoproline sutures diagonally opposed to prevent any movement, as I also do with the bar valve. The tube is trimmed bevel up so that it will extend 1 to 2 millimetres into the anterior chamber. This side-by-side -side comparison with a 30-gauge needle shows just how small the tube is. However, a 25-gauge needle stab just anterior and parallel to the iris plane is used to enter the anterior chamber, as this is roughly the size of the pole glaucoma implant tube. Ideally, the 
eye should be as close as possible to the primary position so the tube does not point towards the cornea in the anterior chamber. The tube is gen then gently fed into the anterior chamber. The back of the plate is then examined for aqueous drainage. And in this respect, the pole seems to be more predictable than the bar valve. In contrast to ligation, which risks early high pressure, stenting permits regulation of flow. And you can see the drainage coming out the back of the tube. A dry sponge is inserted into the small well at the back of the pole glaucom implant plate and then slow aqueous filling of the well should be observed. If the well cannot be seen to be filling slowly, the pressures are likely to remain high in the early postoperative period. If aqueous drainage is brisk, then there will be a very high risk of early postoperative hypotony. Aqueous drainage is brisk and the stent has not been fed right into the anterior chamber. It can be advanced further, increasing resistance. If full length stenting creates insufficient resistance, an additional tenonylon ligature can be applied to the tube, which can be lasered at the slit lamp later. If no drainage is visible, the 6O can be withdrawn stepwise. Sometimes it only needs to be a few millimetres along the tube. If no drainage is visible, ensure the pressure is adequate. Here I'm injecting BSS via 30 gauge needle as there's no paracentesis. Here the well seems to be filling again though the use of fluorescein hasn't actually helped uh, visualize the flow. In rare circumstances, the 6O proline is too tight inside the tube and I've resorted to using 7O. Overall, this simple flow technique minimizes the postoperative extremes after the pole glaucom implant and seems to be a little more predictable than after the bar vault. The tube is then secured tightly to sclera. Uh, I usually use nino nylon. Uh, in this case, uh, there's nino proline. I position the knots away from the tube and away from the limbus to minimize the exposure risk as the tube suture knots are sometimes erode and cause exposure of the tube. The subconjunctival end of the proline is secured to sclera with tissue glue, as is a human pericardial patch graft. The conjunctiva and tenons are closed with tissue glue, and then this is assisted by two or three tenonylon interrupted sutures. Just over a year ago, we published the outcomes at 12 months of 74 patients recruited at six centres implanted with a pole glaucoma implant. The maximum pressure before surgery was at mean 35, although the mean baseline pressure before surgery was 23 and dropping to 13.2 at 12 months. Uh, Preoperative medication 3.3 dropping to 0.3 at 12 months. If we compare these results Roughly with the Ahmed Barvelt comparison study and the Ahmed versus Barvelt study, these are the pooled results at five years. At five years, pooling the Ahmed Barvelt comparison, Ahmed versus Barvelt, the Ahmed valve achieved pressures of 16 and the Barvelt 13.1. If you look at above at the table, at 12 months in the same study, the pressure levels were very similar with the Ahmed at 16.2 and the Barville at 13.7. So the pole glaucoma implant at 12 months is producing pressure levels much closer to that of the Barville at one year and the 
pooled ABC AVB study uh, paper than the AMID valve and medications again similar to the bar belt. So thank you very much for your attention.